All right, returning to Death of an Army, Ypres, 1914. This is volume one of Great War Battles. And uh, as you saw in part one, we uh, made it through kind of the first third, first quarter of the game, first 25%. Um, I've played a couple more turns since the end of that last video. We're all the way up to uh, the October 29th turn. And you can see that the situation is, has changed pretty drastically uh, as we start the German turn here. So first of all, um, all of the French reinforcements that the, the Entente was getting have had a huge effect on the German advance, especially the German, um, the German um, Fourth Army, which started the game over here. Um, these, these French divisions that have moved in have really pushed this left flank. The French decided that they were going to kind of slot in on the left side of the line here. Um, to the left of the uh, ridge at Pascendale. And the reason they wanted to do that, and the reason I was playing them this way, is that the Germans pretty much had a very light, light hold on this flank. Um, and it's not really a flank, you know, obviously this is south and this is north, so the front, let's call it, let's call it the northern part of the front, but from the way I'm looking at it, it's like a left flank. Um, but the Germans had a really tenuous hold on sort of this forested area here, and there were so many French reinforcements pouring in that I really wanted to uh, get them to push the, the weakly held, uh, the, the Germans, those units, um, out of this forest and into this clear terrain so that the French could really exploit with their numbers um, the uh, weak German defenses, and that would allow the French to kind of move in this direction. There was this temptation that if they could if they could kind of push the German front back this direction, um, it would be very difficult for uh, the Germans to to capture Peskindel Ridge. Well, that's happened, but they haven't made as much progress as I think maybe they thought they were going to, although it has been quite uh, significant. As you, if you might remember, the line was stretched out this way, and the French Blitzkrieg here has pushed the Germans back to the breaking point. Um, I'll show you the dead pile here. Here's all of the Germans in that, that 6th Army um, that have died. A lot of regiments dead in there. Um, some independent units dead there. Here's the British dead. Um, now, keeping in mind that these British brigades still have strength on the map since they're three-step units, we do have some French losses, and that's really just the attritional nature of these attacks as they push the Germans back. The Germans doing their best to kind of consolidate and make the um, the attacks painful where they can, but as you can see, I mean, we've got the French 17th in here almost at full strength. We've got the 87th Territorial um, here. We've got some independence units here, French cavalry. Uh, and then uh, in the more recent turns, we have the French 18th Division uh, who's come in here, and we've got the French 31st Division who's come in here, and they've really pushed the Germans off this off this ridge past Pascendale, and uh, they're doing quite quite a good job. Um, but I think that's about to come to an end uh, for a number of reasons. First of all, um, there are still some defensive units in here. The Germans have been pretty good about pulling back and disengaging from the front where uh, not giving the French the ability to sort of mass attacks uh, in the assault phase. Uh, but more importantly, the Germans uh, just got a ton of reinforcements. Four or five divisions in the last two turns have come onto the map. You can see some of them here. Most of them have used Force March to come up from the south. These are from the 6th Army, I believe. Uh, yeah, these are from the German 6th Army. So we've got a division here, we've got a division here, we've got a division here, a division here, and we've got a division here as well. So that's five divisions that have come on. Next turn, there's going to be two more divisions that are going to be entering the map. Um, and so this is probably marking the end of the really uh, heavy French advance because it's going to get a little bit more bogged down with heavy defenders. What the Germans want to do here and what I'm going to try and do, obviously these these Highland hexes are victory points, and it's very thinly held here with British cavalry that have been skirmishing back and forth with German cavalry. A lot of reduced units in here. The British are not faring too well. A lot of this is artillery, you can see, with the zero movement points. Uh, a lot of damage being inflicted on the British, and that's one of the things that I wanted to accomplish with the Germans because the British are going to start getting pretty decent replacement points uh, coming up. So we want to hammer them as much as possible so those replacements aren't having an effect that allow them to go back on the offensive. In addition to that, the Germans have received a gigantic boatload of artillery and some really heavy, heavy artillery in here. Siege artillery. You've got eight points, eight points, eight points. That's going to come in handy when the Germans mount their counterattack, and they're getting in a position to do that. You can see that the 6th Bavarian Reserve has moved in down here, trying to threaten the British 1st, who's really only got two units and a bunch of artillery. What we're trying to do is we're going to cross, we're going to cross this river here, uh, right here, where, where this uh, cavalry unit's been holding... Um, War, uh, Warnaton, uh, Wachnaton, I guess you would call it, Wachnaton. Um, we're going to cross here. We're going to put the pressure on the British here. We're going to force the British line to have to, f have to adjust and swing this way because there's not a lot of force down here. The British are going to have to get off the ridge and they're going to have to back these units up because they're going to be easily overrun by the German divisions coming down. Up here, we've got German divisions slotting in here where the, where the, uh, Entente sort of opened this gap and were able to push this way. You can see this big corridor in here. 
near the ridge. We're gonna get these units over and this division here is gonna slot in and basically try and slow down the French. They're not gonna be used offensively, but they're gonna just gonna try and bleed the French off um, as the sixth army sort of moves back and regroups a little bit. Um, there's still a lot of artillery intact for the Germans up here. A lot of the units have been taking the brunt of it. This guy is gonna be out of supply if he doesn't get out of there. We're gonna have to do an attack this turn, probably on that hex right here. Um, the French actually outpace their artillery. French artillery in this game are actually pretty uh, long range. I believe they have six hexes of range when they're on their uh, unlimbered side. So uh, the French sort of outpaced their artillery coverage and they had to move a lot of that artillery up. So a lot of the attacks they made last turn didn't have full artillery support. There was a lot of one strength artillery uh, firing at close range. Uh, under these units, and that's why you see some losses there. Um, again, the, the Germans just giving up ground, trading the space um, to try and, you know, just wait it out until they can get some reinforcements. So we're going to continue moving these German divisions in. We're going to take up positions where we think the Entente are weak, and we're going to try and push them off this ridge um, and, and force them to react to what's going on down here. Obviously, if the British need to move down, the French are going to need to cover this. And so I think the uh, Entente offensive here is going to come to an end, and it's really going to be all about the way the Germans um, push forward this attack and try and really bring the hammer blow down. Um, it's going to be interesting, you know, like I said, lots of reinforcements. We do get some more Entente reinforcements for a couple of turns, and then again, more German reinforcements coming in from the 4th Army. This is going to be important because they're going to be able to come in from this side of the map and this side of the map, and so the French are going to have to be careful they don't get cut out of supply as Germans come in this way. Uh, really having a lot of fun. The counter density has increased greatly. Not all of these are combat units. A lot of them are artillery. Um, most divisions come with four artillery uh, battalions. And so when you see all of these counters on the map, it's actually not all combat units. One of the things about the game that I'm struggling with is that it's really hard to read the situation in any given sector because there are so many artillery units. This looks like the Germans could push an assault and have great success, and that's not actually the case. This division actually only has one combat-capable um, regiment left in it here. The rest of it is um, artillery that's parked um, to support a potential attack into the city there. Um, so it, it looks art a little bit deceiving here, but I, I think the system is really solid, and I'm having a lot of fun with it. Um, there's a lot of interesting, crunchy stuff going on, and uh, I'm excited to push forward. So let's get started with the October 29th turn, and I'll check back in when the Germans uh, have had an impact on the uh, Entente line. Well, here we are. Uh, the German counterattack is about to get underway in force. You can see it'll go down the line and show you where we've got uh, German uh, activity. You can see a lot of the divisions have taken their place um a lot in the line against the french who've made a pretty heavy advance almost towards uh Roulet. um but there's going to be uh there's going to be some serious shelling all the way down the line against french positions near Peskindale ridge the germans if they can take control of every Peskindale ridge hex they'll win the game outright and so there's there's a bit of a gap right here that the entente has left that's not good <laughs> um i did not position myself well there uh, and then we're just trying to kick the British out of here to make sure that, that you know, the French have to counterattack this way. More uh, more attacks happening down here. We're just trying to take all of these hexes, if we can, to end the game early. Um, another, more German positions have come down here to kind of separate the uh, the British, um, the thin southern British flank. And uh, the French had to send some reinforcements up this way last turn so that they couldn't and they couldn't send them uh, where there maybe have been more needed because if the Germans broke through here, they would have gone all the way um, to Neuve Eglise and possibly beyond. Um, so yeah, so we're gonna have, we're gonna be using much of the German artillery that has come into the game now. Um, we're able to make lots of uh, artillery, core artillery supported attacks. And uh, I will show you what happens after I resolve all of this stuff, but it's looking like a pretty heavy push from the Germans here on October 31st, 1914. Happy Halloween. Well, after the German counterattack uh, coordinated assault phase, um, they managed to push the British off the ridge here in this general area. Um, importantly, did not do any losses. The British, with this forested terrain, was able to retreat without taking any major losses. Um, the Germans did come in and advance here, specifically the uh, 6th Bavarian Reserve. And really, the, the in the southern end of the ridge here, it's only being held in this hex by this brigade that's still pretty powerful, but... Um, they've lost their grip on Paskindale Ridge in the south. In the north, the Germans again made more advances here near uh, Zonnebeke. Um, and really, it's this hex here and these two hexes here and this one that are being held or that are in contested zones of control um, that are preventing the Germans from winning the game. So the, the Entente is really hanging on um, by a thread at this point. Another, you can see up way up here in the north, another German division has entered the battle. And what I want to do with them is I want to swing them down into this area here and really just put as many casualties as I can um, on the, 30, the French 31st who are, are 
slowly being attrited away um, by uh, by German attacks. Um, we did get some uh, some other advances. We got we disrupted uh, a French unit here. We did some reforming of some of our German units here, just trying to anchor the northern part of the line um, to allow for the offensive uh, on the ridge down here. Unfortunately, uh, in the hasty attack phase, um, the Germans did a couple of attacks, one here to try and eliminate this brigade remnant, and then one down here to try and eliminate this demoralized unit, um, which unfortunately, or disorganized unit, um, and unfortunately, uh, took massive losses in some hasty attacks against those um, against those units, which left uh, artillery exposed here that the uh, British are going to get to counterattack and probably eliminate, and um, severely weakened um, the 54th Reserve here, who's now um, kind of combat ineffective. Can maybe use it, um, you know, to pick someone off somewhere at some point, but they're going to have to retreat off the line. So. It's really, really replicating the World War One feel of like, you get the initial strong surge, you make a lot of progress, and then the follow-up attacks tend to be very, very deadly um, and, and attritional. And you just can never quite make the push that you think, you, the momentum of the push that you think you're gonna get. Um, but I will say that the Germans um, have really uh, put the, the Entente in a bind here. They've got to, the Entente really have to thinly stretch their line. They've really got to defend in some of this good terrain in order to sort of negate the, the German combat power advantage. And I really like the way that um, the artillery in this game, and I'll talk about it more in my final thoughts, but I really like the way that uh, the artillery is used. Um, you have tough choices to make with how you use your artillery. A lot of these German attacks in here were successful because the divisional artillery were able to suppress the British artillery, um, and therefore we were making uh, combats without any modifications, any die roll modifications um, uh, in the British favor. So uh, that's one way you can use the artillery very effectively. Um, we're going over to the Entente side of the turn here. They have got some serious work to do. I'm not sure they're going to be able to counterattack in many places. They're just trying to hang on, hang on. Next turn, they're going to get some some uh, pretty needed reinforcements. The turn after that, they're going to get some pretty needed reinforcements. The line is going to beef up for the Entente. They just need to hold on and not lose the game through this uh, German, German push, basically. So as we're doing the Entente turn here, I thought this would be a great time to just pause and kind of do a quick overview of the way that the, the artillery in this system is uh, pretty nuanced in terms of how you want to use it. So right now what we've got is we've got the French 32nd Division, who, as you saw, slotted in here on the line in the south um, to plug this gap with this huge German advance coming down this, this sort of path between these two highland areas. And they're launching a counterattack with these two stacks here and this independent French uh, cavalry division against this lone German regiment, who is a four combat strength, sorry about that, um, right here in this hex, in this clear terrain hex. Now, when you're, you know, this is the beginning of the Entente turn, this is one of the battles they're doing, one of the few that they're launching on the line. Now, the consideration I have here is that before I launch this attack, do I want to use the French artillery, which you can see here, and there's another one off screen barely that you can't see here. Do I want to use the French artillery for a bombardment on the target, which would add a die roll modifier to the defensive fire that that uh, unit um, is going to be able to use against me before I attack? Or do I want to try and suppress the German 3rd Bavarian uh, Division's artillery, which is all the way up here? Um, and so what's interesting about the dichotomy here is that the German artillery tends to be better, have higher firepower values, 4, 3, 3. Um, and the French artillery tends to have less. You can see they've got two, two. They've got another one off screen also has two. But the French artillery has much more range. And so um, in order for the German artillery to get um, to be useful, they need to get inside the range of the French artillery for the most part. Now, with only two strength, it's going to be really hard to suppress artillery. Um, the French would need to roll a, a three or better because they don't have direct line of sight to these artillery units that they're trying to suppress. So it's a 50-50 chance. And in this particular example, this artillery unit and this artillery unit with a range of six are actually not even within range of the German artillery park back here. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, they come up one section short. That's why the, I, the Germans, why I had them put this artillery here. Um, so uh, in this particular example, suppression may not be the best uh, thing. However, this one off screen here, one, two, three, four, five, six, can actually try and suppress this German, this four German artillery unit. And in defensive fire, a unit is able to uh, call in support from one artillery unit. So this four uh, strength art, uh, infantry regiment could potentially become an eight uh, in the defensive fire phase. So I might want to suppress this particular artillery unit um, because then it wouldn't be contributing for then we'd only be able to contribute th three for the single artillery unit uh, for this uh, German division 
So this choice about whether to stack all this artillery up into a bombardment on the hex or to try and suppress defensive artillery is a really important one and really adds to the asymmetry between the sides uh, because of the ranges and firepower values. This is something that you wouldn't really understand coming in and even reading the rules I didn't fully understand until I put it into practice and showing how the, um, the Entente side can keep their artillery out of harm's way but use it to suppress the more powerful German artillery um, in specific occasions to slow down their advances and slow down their offensives. Now in this particular case I am going to try with this unit here to suppress this forward because every uh, that'll be a column shift for the defensive fire, and every column in this game is super critical. Um, so let's roll it up. It's a two. It doesn't have direct line of sight to that artillery unit, so it needs to roll three or better. It rolled a two, so it actually suppresses this unit. So this particular unit is not going to be able to contribute in defensive fire, and this particular unit down here is not going to be able to contribute to the barrage. Um, so now we're going to use some French offboard artillery, some core artillery. That's four strength. Two, two here, that's six. Two here, that's eight. So we've got an eight-point barrage on the target, and we've actually got a, eh, maybe an eight point barrage. Yeah, eight point barrage on the target. Um, and so let's roll that. That's an eight point barrage from the French artillery. That will give us a die roll modifier. They rolled a six, unfortunately. Um, that is only a, that's a plus two modifier um, to the defensive fire. So now this unit here has four strength plus a three strength from any one of these artillery units in its division. So that's a seven. Well, there is no seven column on the table, so we're down to six. So we got a column shift out of suppressing this four point artillery unit. And uh, it's a plus one modifier because that's what the bombardment caused. So we rolled a five and five on six is plus two. Now that plus two applies to the combat. And so um, we're gonna roll up this combat and see what happens. It's a seven and eight is 15 and four, it's 19 to four. So that is going to be four to one, um, which is really good with a, uh, what did I say, a plus two, I believe. So it's a four to one with a plus two. We'll roll that up. That is a five and that is a one, two. So that means the attacker will take one hit and the attacker will take two hits. Um, or sorry, the attacker will take one hit and the defender will take two hits. And if the defender retreats, um, it can cancel one of those hits because it's in clear terrain, uh, but then it would take a hit anyway. So I have to decide how the Germans want to respond to that and how they want to deal with that. Um, but that's a little bit of an example about how the artillery rules in this game and the way that you can use artillery can really affect the combat. Um, and sometimes it's better to suppress and sometimes it's better to bombard. Um, and it really, it's interesting as you start to get your artillery limbered and in stacks, makes it much better on defense, but much worse on the offense. So a lot to really think about, about using the artillery. And that seems to be what this, this particular game, if not this system is really focused on is use of artillery, different ways to use artillery and how you, that, that becomes a tool for your offensives and counter offensives. I want to do uh, just real quick uh, show the absolutely tenuous position that uh, the Entente finds themselves in here around Peskindale Ridge um, across the map. I mean, they are holding on for dear life as we enter November um, in this game. But essentially, the 3rd Brigade of the British 1st Division and, it's a, and some artillery here are holding this hex, the... Germans did manage to push off the 2nd Cavalry and now have opened this bridge. They've opened the way. That was a key objective that they needed to accomplish uh, as part of the Southern Advance to join the front across the canal here. And that is going to prevent uh, this unit here from... Uh, it basically, it's got it's, it's going to be hit on three sides next turn. And so uh, the British need to hold that so they don't lose the game. But even going up the line, the British tried to do some attacks on some of the weaker German units and suffered horribly. We got a loss here to this 2nd Brigade of the British... We had more losses down in the south um, around, uh, what was the town? Ploegis Street. I uh, don't speak Dutch um, or Flemish for that matter. Um, so yeah, so all the way all the way up here, the British holding it in the south on there, the German advance having pushed the British uh, right off the top of that uh, high ground, um, driving in this way, the French now holding the very northern end um, of the ridge and they are in real trouble because there are three German divisions driving in on this key this key point here. We've got the German, uh, well, first of all, we've got the German 26th over here who's been putting some losses on the French. We've got the German 3rd coming in this direction. We've got the German 30th coming in this direction, and we've got the German 39th coming in this direction. So one, two, three angles of attack on this little salient here that has split the French and British 
front, and the French need to hold these two hexes, otherwise uh, the Entente's going to be in real trouble, uh, and we may see an end to the game with a successful um, German victory um, here. But uh, yeah, they're trying to reinforce. They're gonna this this is going to force as we're about to do Entente movement. This is going to force the Entente to shorten the line across here. Um, and they had to give up a lot of their positions in this direction. The French are shifting south to try and prevent the Germans uh, from you know basically making it sudden death. Uh, but as you see, the front. Um, the German offensive, even just three turns, four turns in, um, has really pushed the Entente to the breaking point. Well, another example of just how tight the game is. Uh, the Germans went for it. They went for the auto victory. They made a hasty attack from this hex to this hex here. Uh, both units actually got wiped out. Uh, and there was no, because there was no artillery support from this attack with two German cavalry divisions that were both reduced. Um, they did successfully eliminate the uh, British uh, brigade remnant that was there from the 3rd British Division, but unfortunately with no units to advance, uh, uh, they couldn't take the ground, the Germans couldn't. Um, so that did boot the British from this side of Peskindale Ridge, and then up here we just did a hasty attack uh, with some more Germans out of the 30th Division here against this French defender in the 18th. There are a couple of units uh, here on this very tip tail of uh, the northern part of Peskindale Ridge. Um, it actually was a one-to-one -one attack, so not very good odds. The Germans were kind of going for a long shot, but they rolled really well, and it actually ended up doing two two losses to either side. So um, lots of loss of manpower, but unfortunately the Germans unable to uh, kick unable to kick the uh, the French out of there, um, and it's going to be really interesting to see uh, how they fortify and defend this particular hex. The British are going to be able to move. Actually, they're not going to be able to move back in here. There's zones of control in these hexes. So the British, um, this this actual, this attack, though, it was pure, uh, it was a victory. Um, so all the Germans got to do is, is take that and hold it for a turn and hold everything else, and they would win an auto victory. But We've got more French uh, reinforcements coming on the board. We're going to get a chance to reposition these guys. So it's a very, very tense, close game. Um, the Germans in that classic World War One. if I can just make one more push, one more push, uh, and doing it at kind of bad odds and, and losing a lot of manpower, uh, I'm not sure if that will have long-term effects, but uh, we'll see what they can do on the defense coming up. And uh, might be a victory next turn. We might continue on, soldier on. So here we go. Well, if you needed any further proof about where the <laughs> the hot spot on the map is, where the Entente is pouring in most of their resources, it's up here. This defense in depth by the French, they were able to get a couple of infantry regiments from a fresh division into that final ridge hex, and they are just ready to fill that with bodies as long as they it takes to keep the Germans out of it. So we're see, we'll see what's going to happen. I think that the Germans have a pretty strong position here in that they do have an independent unit here on the opposite sides. Uh, of, of this hex that they can use to attack. And if there's any sort of retreat, um, for some reason, uh, that's going to be difficult for the French to deal with. But the, uh, there's four steps here, and so there's not gonna, it's not going to be one attack that's going to do it. Um, they're gonna, the Germans are going to have to get real lucky in order to take that hex this turn, and I don't think it's probably possible. Um, but you'll notice that the French line did have to fall back from their position in the north, and that's because we've got three full divisions coming in, three of them from the... Um, uh, the German 4th Army, which means they can come in along this side uh, of the map. So they had to fall back to protect their supply lines because if the Germans came down here and, there was, and they were able to link up with this part of the front, the French were going to be completely surrounded. Um, so it's going to be... <laughs> it's. Going to be real interesting to see what happens in the coming turns, assuming the Germans don't win it out right here. I don't think it's possible, but we'll see. The British have pushed back. They're very close to being able to take... Um, take parts of the southern line. Um, so the Germans are going to try and get this division in to fill in along here. Although, uh, you know, some of these here are able to f come this direction as well. I think there's too much rough terrain for them to get right to the front. Excuse me. Um, and so we're kind of entering kind of a stalemate a little bit uh, for the second time this game. Um, but... <laughs> The, there are no more British reinforcements. What the British have left now are replacement points. They got four last turn, which was huge. That allowed them to refill um, and sort of up the manpower of some of these brigades that had been reduced. Um, they're going to get this turn. They're going to get two more than five on the next turn, then another three. So the British are um, going to be able to get back to full strength. Uh, and so I think we're in for a grind um, unless the Germans can pull something out of their hat to, um, to take the ridge. Uh, but if the game were to end um, no normally right now, the Germans would have a very clear victory. I mean, the Germans have taken two of these ridge hexes down here. They're coming in um, 
basically if they can drive down here they could take those but essentially they've got control of all of this so it's not like they're losing they just aren't going to get the auto win probably but i'm um, still having fun and um you know given how many more units we still have uh, <laughs> uh there's still a lot that can happen um very counter dense game as you can see well it finally happened uh the germans won the battle of peskendale up here they just threw manpower at the problem until they could solve it and it was the german sixth uh army third division that ended up taking the heights here forcing the french after massive casualties on both sides there was a, a organized assault with this independent unit here that reduced the french and then there was a hasty attack with no artillery support thrown in against the hill and that forced the french to uh, be eliminated there um so the the germans taking heavy losses although still most of the division reduced but still all in this hex um and that was that unfortunately um at the very last possible moment on the turn before that, the British uh, third division down here did manage to push the defenders holding this hex out of the way. And that has allowed the Entente to stave off defeat for another turn um, in this particular area of the battlefield. And actually the British are gearing up for a, another series of attacks here and down here um, to further make more gains. They're gonna be able to move into this hex here and these are big British brigades. A bunch of territorial reinforcements arrived this turn, five British replacements. You would assume those were New Zealanders, Australians, Indians, and other parts of the British Empire being tossed into the line. And that has um, reformed a bunch of these units, including this uh, um, first division, second brigade, uh, unit here and others down the line. So the British are slowly coming back uh, online to full strength. The silver lining is that they weren't able to use all their replacements um, the, uh, on the map right now. They've got three sitting in reserve, so they are going to be able to replace three steps um, and more actually before the game is over as we go through the turns. But um, the British getting ready to counterattack on their own to try and take back uh, some of these ridge hexes. Not a lot the Germans can do. They did get the 25th reserve down here to try and take up defensive positions and then uh, launch their own assault to drive these units out. But it's going to be a tall order with six strength points. And so uh, the Germans, you know, they're going to get one more bite at it in a couple of turns time when the final batch of reinforcements is on. But it looks like it was just a day late and a dollar short for the auto victory um just on the on the turn before the battle of peskendale uh so we're going to continue on and um it looks like we're in for the long haul we are headed into the final major reinforcement turn of the game and uh it's going to come down i think to these final few turns we're on november we're just going to start the november 8th turn you know obviously we played in november 12th and that's when this whole uh, rigmarole ends, but um, the British counterattack has actually been pretty effective. Um, the territorial replacements that they've been getting every turn, you can see replacements every turn all the way through, and they're allowed to save those replacements turn to turn, means that the British can launch attacks without worrying about manpower losses. They can take those losses. Um, uh, when they are attacked, they can take those losses to hold their ground and cause losses in a trip the German, uh, German side of the line, which they have done pretty successfully here with the 4th Bavarian. They've done really successfully up here with the 25th Reserve Division. And the 6th Bavarian, this is a really thinly held section of the line right here, and the British are just going to keep pounding away at that as much as possible um, to keep control of some of these Highland Hexes. Now, this turn, oh, and I should also mention down here, because of those territorial replacements, the um, the 4th Division, who hasn't seen much action f uh, since very early on uh, in the game, has actually managed to break the stalemate down here at uh, Armientieri. Uh, sorry, let's say that properly. Armientieri. Um, and they've pushed this reduced uh, German regiment back out of the city without taking any losses themselves. And now this is opening up an interesting situation here. We've kind of got along the line, we've got kind of a, a coiled snake eating its own tail where the Germans are in kind of a precarious position if they lose that anchor. Uh, that anchor was holding this bridge, which means that this... Um, particular brigade if it wants to can cross here and put pressure on this flank it can get to this artillery park here that's really um, been defending the gains that the germans have made down here uh, since that happened and so if that starts to unravel the germans are going to have to pull back and give up some of these positions they'll probably pull back this way um, because they want to hang on to these two high ground hexes if they possibly can but uh, if this regiment gets defeated um, there's just a zip up and around that's uh, going to have to be responded to um, because this division has been pretty inactive. They haven't taken any really any losses except for over here. Um, further in, obviously, we've got the British making further headway, pushing the, the sort of exhausted German defenders back. 
Um, and then the French are in a little bit of trouble over here. So we've got this little this little salient, this little bulge, and the French are actually in danger now of being collapsed upon. Um, I, I decided I was going to try and hold this one more turn just because this hex here is good ground. And um, if they give that up, they've got to fall pretty far back to these, these village hexes here in order to have sort of the same defensive benefits. But the Germans are really trying to surround this little pocket here. And what's going to really aggravate this right now is that because down this flank, the German um, reserve reinforcements that they got in the last big batch have been able to push the French defenders back again back to this wood now we've got three reserve divisions who are going to be able to come on here and really encircle around and if they're able to cut off this pocket uh, all of these guys will start attriting or there's access to the british artillery park here so um, they're going to have to give this up this turn um, it's going to be you know, kind of dicey i maybe left it a little bit too long but these there's enough movement points to get out to somewhere in here i'm thinking that i might want to try and hold this creek line because as you can see there's two french divisions who are going to come on from this direction so if we can kind of just put a speed bump in front of them and let this mission to like encircle these defenders even if i just encircle like these defenders that would be a, be a pretty big win uh for the germans it won't count for points or anything but at least i can put the pressure on to make it so that if the you know the, the french are gonna have to pull back and like reform the line but as you can see the line goes like that all the way down and we've gone back and forth um, all along so uh, we're in the final home stretch now this is the last run of turns and uh, this will make or break the game um, the, the, the Entente I think is a long shot to win it they have a lot of work to do I think it's probably beyond their means to take back any of any of the ridge in here just the French are so decimated um, they can't really go on the offensive they're just trying to hold their ground um, it's really going to be up to the British to uh, make the push they've got the brigades they've got the combat strength and it's going to be a matter of can the Germans get They've got basically one more division worth of attacking combat strength that can successfully push these guys out of there uh, before the game is over. Uh, but I, it's going to be a tall order. It's going to take them at least two turns to get down here. And by that time, there's maybe two or three turns left in the game. So we'll see how it goes. But right now, the Germans on track to uh, win this game. We are two turns from the end of the game. Uh, and the northern flank of the Entente line has absolutely collapsed. Um, the 4th Army Reserve reinforcements that came in on this edge a couple of turns ago are wreaking havoc. The French are scrambling to form some sort of line so that they don't get fully encircled, sort of maintaining this salient while the battles rage back and forth uh, for control of the Pescandale Ridge. Um, the French made a lunge here. As you can see, there's a single reduced strength regiment now holding this hex. They managed to push the Germans off of it, but that was about as far as they could make it, and I suspect that the Germans will be able to take this back next turn. Although, who knows, right? I mean, they've still got to win the, the battle there. Um, but basically, the French are trying to hold this sort of part of the line, this flank of the line open. You can see the Germans have kind of moved down and created their own little salient here. The British counterattacks have made pretty good progress, but they have absolutely, again, chewed through those really tough brigades um, in order to make that ground. And now, the Germans' final reinforcements are in position to launch attacks and hopefully kick them out of here. Now, it should be noted at this point um, that I have looked at the victory conditions, and the Entente is in a much better position than I thought they were. Um, the Entente controls all eight hexes here, controls all five hexes here, still controls this hex here, um, and they've got one in here, plus the six um, that they have right now, and that would leave them in a winning position. So in the final two turns, the Germans do have to put on a full court press to try and take some of these. Obviously, this down here is out of the question, um, but I think it's still possible the Germans do manage to take m almost all of these uh, near Peskendale before the game is over. Uh, you can see the counter density now. We're at full bore <laughs> with the counter density um, at the end of the game. If you go back and look at the beginning of this video where we were, um, you can see just how many reinforcements come on over the course uh, of the almost two weeks that this game covers. I've laid out the dead piles for you so you can see exactly how many regiments and artillery uh, battalions have been lost. Um, a lot of a lot of losses on the German side and the French side. The, the Brits fearing a little better, although keep in mind some of these are three-step units in here, so it actually looks less than it actually is. Um, but coming to the conclusion, and uh, I will be back with sort of the final board position. We'll crown a winner, and then I'll give you my final thoughts. Well, here we are at the end of the campaign of Death of an Army, Ypres 1914, and uh, I've been playing this game for a long time. I know it doesn't seem like it because I've gotten the videos out pretty quick, but this was a huge hour investment um, into getting the full campaign played. And these are the final positions uh, of the armies at the end of two weeks of brutal fighting um, in and around th the town of uh, the city of Ypres in Belgium. And uh, 
Whew. Uh, <laughs> I feel exhausted. Uh, it, I, well, I feel exhausted. The armies are definitely exhausted. Coming down into the final few turns, there was not very much attack power. Um, able to muscle out uh, units. We had uh, basically a static alignment all the way across the front, and I can see why the trenches would get set up shortly after this, uh, because, boy, there were a lot of bodies. Let me show you. This is how many casualties in regiments and cavalry divisions that every power involved in this battle in these two weeks took. Uh, you know, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven... British brigades, eight British brigades absolutely eliminated all of these divisions. This, uh, the French 38th, uh, absolutely hammered. Um, here's the Germans brigades. The, the green is the uh, fourth army. The light green is the sixth army. Tons of independent cavalry, uh, just absolutely annihilated. Um, but you can see the Germans, the German fourth army kept a lot of their manpower intact in those divisions. And that's why most of the field um, has their units in and around the key areas here. Um, yeah, it, what a game. Um, the final score um, here, it was, a, it was a central power, it was a German victory. It was a 25 to 17, counting up all these hexes here. The Germans ended up uh, taking 22 of the 24 hexes at Peskindale Ridge. The British, uh, the British could not hold on to what they had taken. Um, those, those final reinforcements that the Germans got out of the 6th Army that were able to come in here, they had enough attack power to push the British off. And uh, they couldn't they couldn't counterattack. There was some pretty deadly. Uh, they, they tried. The British tried to counterattack in here, but it ended up wiping both stacks. That's why there's a big hole here. Um, that's why there's a bunch of units. You know, there's all this artillery, but really only one unit left from the division here. Uh, this division is only artillery left. Um, so it was very costly for the British to try and take that back. And and uh, they ultimately only held on to these two hexes here. Um, the Germans on the final term did manage to. I'm not even going to try and pronounce that. With shot day, with shit, um, managed to push the British um, away from this sort of rise here, captured the village, managed to take all three hexes there. Um, they were not able to displace the French defenders on this particular high ground hex, and then um, they successfully did hold uh, the Kemmel Ridge, and um, this one is called Nouvelle Eglise. Um, so 25 to 17, the game was really uh, won. Uh, there was actually a, a time late in the game where the, the Entente was actually winning um, based on the hexes that they had taken and they still held, but they could not outlast the German machine um, who came in with some attack power right at the end. And the French, whew, if you remember the way this game transpired, we had a German drive this way. We had a French drive. I mean, the French had driven the Germans way back to here. And then, okay, of course, the German uh, counterattack here pushed them back. This was this was like a hinge, basically, back and forth throughout the game, um, over the course of the game. If you go back and look at the last video, or earlier even in this video where we started, um, just huge, huge uh, pushes back and forth here. This remained relatively static, as you would expect with all this terrain. The Germans were able to drive and uh, knock the French out. They forced the French to have to withdraw to get this line up so that the, the Germans couldn't surround them. Um, so there was some maneuver, although it felt pretty slow, but... Ultimately, it was a Central Powers German victory, and um, I had a ton of fun playing it. Um, let's talk about the game. Let me talk about my conclusions about this. So yeah, conclusions. Um, well, first of all, let, let's talk about what I like about the game, what I dislike about the game. So uh, I'll start with what I dislike about the game, or at least if I don't personally dislike it, what I find others might dislike about it, um, or others might dislike about it. So um, first of all, <laughs> massively counter-dense game. Um, as you get through it. Obviously, when you start, there are not that many units on the board. It's still quite a few, but because every division has three to four artillery units in addition to their three to four infantry units, um, we are talking about a, a hugely dense uh, game. Now, the stacking limit is not so dense. It's, it's four stacking points, and that's usually two units until some start to get reduced. So you're not talking about big stacks, but the sheer number of counters on the board at any given time is going to be immense. And this, I mean, you know, this is how we finished, this is all stuff that was on the map at some point um, that came off because they were eliminated. Um, and so not all of this is on there together, but it was a fairly dense um, uh, a fairly dense game starting from somewhere in here. Right around in here is when it got really dense. Um, and so that may turn you off. I didn't mind it too much, and I actually really like how intelligently, um, because we're talking about a regimental scale game where each unit's a regiment, 
or battalions for the artillery or divisions for the cavalry. Um, you really got the sense of the story of each individual division as they were engaging. You, you're incentivized to keep them close together because a single division is allowed to attack together and you're not allowed to attack with two different divisions. So you want to keep them kind of in their position on the front. Um, and you're incentivized to use them together in that way and then within range of their own artillery because you can't use a, a division's artillery on any other uh, division's combat unless it's an independent unit. Um, and so you really get these individual stories of each of these divisions, um, good or bad, right? So, you know, here we had the, um, the first, the British first, right, down to its last reduced brigade, um, essentially, you know, a regiment there. Um, and they were, they were trying to pound the Germans out of this southern, this southern part of the ridge near the canal. Um, we had the story of the, uh, of the German 5th Division, or sorry, the German, the, the British 5th Division here who valiantly held this ridge until the final turn and put on a lot of pain uh, into this particular unit's, um, division's units here. Um, and so you get these little stories all across the map of the different divisions and how they perform and what befell them and the heroic attacks that they made and the disastrous attacks that they made a lot of times. So um, that's, really, that's really cool. And because the divisions are broken up into so many counters, you get that sense. But if you are not a fan of counter density, you are not probably going to enjoy the experience here. Um, that leads into my next sort of dislike. And this is something I, I struggled with for most of the game until I could really get a sense of where things were. Because we're talking about so many artillery units, this looks from a distance like, wow, how did the Entente hold out against all these German units? What you're really looking at here are artillery parks all supporting the front line. The front line is only really this. These are all the combat units, right, that are here. But you've got this entire interior section of all these artillery units, all of these artillery units. And so it makes the game intimidating to look at because you have so many artillery battalions on the map. And each of those battalions um, frequently are going to be firing at the same target, but you've also got options about suppressing artillery. That's where a single artillery unit can fire at another unit to try and suppress them so they can't contribute on defense. It's a lot to take in, and at any given moment, it's really hard to read the game state until you really start picking through the stacks um, and really looking at the hotspots you're trying to, to affect with your operations. And if you... So solo, it probably was compounded a little bit because I was playing both sides, but even then, I feel like trying to figure out what your opponent's going to do or how their artillery is, is arranged, it's just very hard to look at the game state at any given moment and see what you should do, what's going to happen to you, what your opponent's trying to do. And that's good, I guess, for a fog of war, but it makes it really a bear to play. Um, so you want to be careful there. If you're not, if if large, dense games intimidate you, I would say that this is on the more intimidating side. It does not do very much to streamline the the view of the action on a turn to turn basis. Um, the other thing that I'm kind of torn on, which I like in one respect and don't like in the other, is the combat system. Um, so here's the combat chart. We've got three rolls per combat. You're doing two on the fire combat results table, and then you're doing one on the melee combat results table. And each of these results here modifies the next roll in the sequence. So the attacker fires with their artillery. You look at here and see what the DRM is going to be for the defender's defensive fire with their artillery and defending units. Whatever they get, you add that modifier to their roll and then their strength, and whatever they get becomes a modifier on the actual attack roll, and, which is bad, right? You don't want positive modifiers. You want to roll low in this game. And so you're doing these three-step calculations for any given combat. And a lot of the time, you're, especially in the mid-game, you are attacking across the line. You're doing eight, nine combats per turn, especially as the Germans. And you're doing three rolls per combat. You're doing your 27 die rolls just to get through a single combat phase. Then you go to movement, and that's where you've got to look at the board and see how you're moving, where you're moving, you know, what's happening with your units, that's a whole nother beast. And then there's another combat phase where you can do hasty attacks, and that's hex to hex. But again, you're doing two rolls for that combat usually because you can't support off, uh, hasty attacks with offensive artillery. So all of that is to say that it is a very mechanically heavy game. It is a very dense game to look at. It is very mechanically heavy to play. It really plays very slow. This is not a fast-playing game. It's a very deliberate game. And obviously part of that is World War I was a very static type of experience. Even in 1914, before we got to the trenches... We're still talking about a static front line and you're making attacks along the thing and you're shifting units out and putting units back into their place that are fresh, right? And so there's going to be a lot of doing that. Um, I found by the end of the game that the way that I preferred to do each of the combats that really um, saved a lot of time was just actually roll three dice at the same time and then figure out what happens. So I would roll these three dice. I'd make the red one the attacker artillery. I would look at the combat chart and see, okay, five based on my strength. That would modify then the defender artillery dice, which I would then change to whatever it needs to be. Um, and then that would modify the final combat die. So I was able to get through combats pretty quickly at the end once I started rolling three dice. And I would highly recommend that you do that. The game only comes with one die, um, but I would recommend 
then that when you play, you actually do the three dice uh, roll and um, it, it solves a lot of those issues. It's actually the same complaint I had with Mike Resch's 1914 series, which is there's just a lot of die rolls to get the World War I uh, combat effect properly implemented. So that's a, that's a big one. I also printed off from BGG, someone very kindly made this one page sequence of play, which is very, very helpful in terms of remembering about artillery um, uh, suppression, um, what to do in each combat, and then in hasty combat, um, uh, what you need to, how that's different from regular assault. Um, so I would recommend printing this off from BGG. I think it's the only file in the file section, uh, but very handy to, as you're learning the game. Eventually you won't need this, but um, it's not a complex game. It's very simple, but it's good to uh, get your head around what's going on. Um, so that's, that's all the stuff that I, I think I probably didn't like. Um, it's, it's slow to play. Um, it is hard to read in terms of game state, not hard to read the counters or, or, or rules, but hard to read the game state and it is very dense. This is, uh, especially the campaign scenario, I don't foresee this campaign scenario being playable two-player in a single day unless you've played this game a ton and you're using the three-die roll system that I came up with. If you're trying to play the campaign, expect to spend a weekend playing this, which um, credit to Revolution for uh, bringing out sort of a mini monster here, I would say. Uh, I'd say this, this is approaching monster territory uh, in terms of number of pieces and um, time to play, not necessarily complexity. But the shorter scenarios, the, the attack scenario, which is seven turns, and the intro, the, um, the Battle of Longamark scenario, which is five turns, those are easily completable probably in one sitting, a longer sitting, I would say. Um, certainly this one has less counters, uh, the, the sort of opening scenario there. Um, so yeah, so that's what you should be prepared for. Now let's talk about the things I really do like about this game. So first of all, the components, as you can see, are very nice. I love the counters. They are large counters. Or, um, they appear to be three quarters of an inch or nine sixteenths of an inch counters. Um, they're really, really nice. Uh, they are very readable. The color bars to show you which unit, which division units are in. The, um, the attack or firepower stacking and movement values, very big, very clear to read. I love that, like I said in, in, when I, in my unboxing, I love the fact that the flags of the nation are in the NATO symbol. I think that's a really nice touch. Um, the map is functional. Um, it's not beautiful, but it is certainly not bad looking. Um, and, it, and it really um, displays the information, the key information you need in the campaign scenario, which is these high ground hexes. Those are very easily distinguishable, and uh, that's really all you can ask for. Um, the... Uh, so, so yeah, so the components are great, um, the, and the map is great. Um, the gameplay itself, um, I actually really enjoyed. Um, it is, it is a little bit exhausting, I, I will say, uh, playing it solo, and I can imagine it playing the whole campaign to face-to-face probably exhausting, but that is what you kind of want out of a World War One game. You know, like I said, the exhaustion can be felt with me as the player, but also with the units and the forces here. You know, eventually at the end of the game, we were just out of attack power, right? And you really start to see why World War I was such a slog because you're tempted by these small incremental gains that you feel like you should be able to get. And the way the combat table is arranged in this game is it's very attritional. It actually reminds me a lot of this, um, Soissons uh, from uh, Legion War Games, which I did a video on last year uh, on this channel. It's a very, very attritional combat table. You can see it's mostly one or two losses in either direction. Very rarely will you get three losses, and that's on the extreme end of higher odds or lower odds. Um, and so any given attack, any given combat in this game is typically going to involve uh, one or two losses to one side or the other, or is going to force a retreat. So you've got a lot of push-pull and you've got a lot of incremental losses. And all that leads to, like I said, coming back to the narrative, divisions being ground down over time. And, um, and yeah, and it really gives you that World War I feel about the usage of manpower and how they were being um, thrown into the meat grinder, basically. Uh, I think the designer, Kerry Anderson, did an amazing job of capturing um, the World War I feel, especially at this scale, which again is a regimental scale per unit, divisional scale per formation. It almost actually, as I was playing it, feels a lot like a um, grand tactical game because um, as you're playing the game, um, a lot of the things that you're doing and a lot of the ways that you're uh, conducting your operations and the way that you're targeting specific things and moving your units around, there is kind of a grand tactical feel. You're making tactical decisions a lot of the time in addition to your strategic decisions where you're trying to get you know units on the front and where to push them. So um, you know, it kind of straddles that interesting line, and I think this is a really good scale for this World War I and this battle. Um, now, speaking of this battle, I'm actually very curious to see, this is labeled as a volume one of the Great War Battle series that he's working on. I'm very curious to see where this system goes next. Um, I think, you know, if there's more games in this system, I think there's a lot of opportunity to expand the rules with more um, World War I stuff, especially the technology. I would love to see how this system handles tanks. I would love to see how it handles airplanes. 
um, and air power and scouting and that kind of thing. I would love to see how it handles larger uh, engagements on the East Front potentially, or even in um, the Balkans or you know other theaters of World War I. Um, there's a lot of room for this series to grow. Not all the rules in the core system rulebook are actually used in this game. So there is rail movement in the system, but we don't use it in this game. This is just for historical purposes. Um, and then the, the, the specific rules for this game are very small. It's only two pages basically of special rules um, for Ypres 1914. I can see entrenchments um, becoming something very important in future volumes if we're getting into the trench warfare period. Um, and I would love to see things like Stostrupen and um, the, the Hindenburg line. You know, there's just a lot of stuff in World War I where this system really has a nice core to it and really gives you that feel and really nails the fundamentals of World War I, but can then be built upon with um, other stuff that made World War I interesting. Um, in more interesting terrain as well, I think, would have a, a big impact on, uh, on what he's got going here. So... Um, hopefully that's a helpful overview for you if this is something you're thinking about picking up. Um, I think as a World War I game, um, there's, it, it's very good. Um, not the most playable game in the world, but if you're able to look past that and get past that and not intimidated by those things I said earlier, I think this is a really, really great debut of a new system. Um, and uh, from a, a designer who really understands World War I. And um, I, I think there's promising things in the future for this. Um, yeah, uh, that's that's really uh, my conclusion. I don't know that I would play this again soon just because it took me so long and I felt like I poured so much of myself into it. Um, but uh, it's a solid production. And uh, if you're looking for something at the regimental scale, um, there's not, you know, most of the World War One stuff we have is strategic or operational or extremely tactical. And this is kind of fits a, a space that we don't really have a lot of um, as far as I'm aware. And uh, because of that, I think it's worth playing and experiencing um, this particular part of the Western Front of World War One uh, with this game. So um, I hope you enjoyed that. And if you have any questions or you want to discuss the game further, I'm happy to do that in the comments. Not sure what I'm going to do next. Probably will not be something as long as this. Um, and I might be heading back to the Napoleonic era for a bit. Um, we'll see. But uh, thank you for watching this playthrough of uh, Great War Battles, Volume 1, Death of an Army, Ypres, 1914. That is a mouthful. <laughs>